Hello everybody and uh, welcome to our first uh, week of the Art for Gaming class um, and um, let me just uh, start talking about how we could uh, go ahead and install the program that we will be using throughout this semester for for this class and the projects that we develop essentially uh, three-dimensional uh, graphics, uh, modeling, lighting, materials, and animation using Autodesk's 3D as Smacks on the Autodesk Educational uh, website. Uh, register as a student if you have not already done so. And um, according to your student agreement with Autodesk, you could download 3DS Max and uh, other uh, Autodesk um, software and program packages uh, that uh, are available as student um, packages. Uh, essentially, they are full packages. You have all the uh, tools and materials and everything that I the professional version um, provides you with. But with your student licenses, uh, you can download and install them for free for three years. It's um, downwards compatible. So I will right now go ahead and show you how to get there, how to get a copy of Autodesk 3ds Max 2011 or 10, uh, how to set up your uh, student account with Autodesk uh, Education, and essentially download and activate your products. Um, my products and everything has been activated, so uh, so in that. Uh, I, I can't reactivate them uh, because even if I uninstall the software, the um, license will not expire until the date has come. And essentially, um, uh, I'll just show you the pages and, and the processes. And once you install the software and you start it up, it will tell you that you have 30 days trial or you can register it. So you go on the uh, educational website, you get your copy of license, the license number and the product key, uh, and then you enter the numbers in the Autodesk uh, 3ds Max software. It will redirect you to um, the Autodesk uh, web educational website, asks you to log in with your account, uh, use username and password, and then it activates your product and you will be able to use this product fully functional for three years. Uh, uh, one thing to notice, this is an edu ed educational software, so um, according to the licenses, you can only use this for educational purposes. You cannot use this for professional purposes and essentially to create products and, and uh, make a benefit of it. Uh, however, if you do want to use that uh, professionally, you could uh, use Autodesk's professional student to professional discount, uh, which essentially knocks down some percentage of the price, and instead of uh, spending thousands of dollars, you spend a lot less um, to upgrade your license to professional. So that being said, let me uh, show you how you could uh, use Autodesk educational website or educational program to set up an account for yourself and to access uh, the software packages from Autodesk that uh, are available for students for educational purposes and then how to download uh, the Autodesk and then you go ahead and install it and then you need to activate it. All right, here's how we can uh, access the software and get the licenses. So in a nutshell, you go to the Autodesk website, uh, you find the educational pages and I will show you in the video um, how you can do this. Um, you register as a student or if you already have registered uh, uh, as a student you can uh, simply just log in um, and then you will find the download pages and you find Autodesk 3ds Max 2011 English version 32 and 64 bit edition um, uh, you click on it then you have the option of downloading it or getting a serial number you click on the serial number it gives you a serial number and a product key and uh, then you click on uh, the download button it will essentially download the um, to, uh, Autodesk 3ds Max 2011 for you uh, once downloaded you install it and I will show you that in the next steps how to do this so here's how it works so here we are at the university web page and um, you need to go to the autodesk.com um, once in autodesk.com you will see um, several options you'll see uh, industries products uh, purchase support and community 
at the top of the page. Um, move your mouse over the um, uh, purchase option and from the pop-up menu click on the education. When you click on the education it will um, show you uh, what this is and how you can um, uh, essentially uh, find access to the educational uh, software uh, and packages and what they have to offer. So from the list to the left click on students option and in the students option you will see on the top of the page there is an Autodesk student community uh, link and because I've already clicked on it it's uh, showing uh, a different color. So click on the stu Autodesk student um, community and it would prompt you to the student.autodesk.com you, you could directly put students.autodesk.com uh, in your prompt and then click on join the community today. When you click on the join the community today, if this is your first time um, in uh, the Autodesk, um, you would have to uh, put all this information and essentially click the submit button. Now I have already done this, so I'm um, already logged in. If you already have a register for uh, if you already have registered for this, you could simply uh, go on the top right corner of the page and there there's going to be a login uh, option. I'm already logged in so I don't have that option in here. So once you do that and you uh, register, then you could go to the um, software packages essentially that you could download and as you see here the products such as uh, Maya uh, motion Builder, Mudbox, uh, 3S Max Design um, are already uh, available for your download. Now I want the Autodesk 3DS Max download and I have already clicked on the Autodesk 3DS Max, Max um, software. If you wanted to download Maya you could click on the Maya and uh, let's do the Autodesk 3DS Max which is our software package uh, you need to select an, uh, a version. The 2010 and 2011 are available for the um, download. Now I click on the 2011 and then it takes me to the um, Autodesk 3DS Max 2011 3264-bit edition. I already have um, acquired the license and so my license, my, my serial number for the uh, software and the product key is already here and I just pluck them out so that you could get your own and uh, then you could click on download and when you click on download it would download the Autodesk from the website to your uh, your computer so I already have done that so it is already on my computer and uh, next thing you need to do is to find where the uh, software has been uh, downloaded uh, click on um, the um, uh, setup uh, icon and it would uh, start setting up your software. Uh, once the software is set up then you could go to start programs Autodesk and Autodesk uh, 3ds Max 2011 and then click on the um, software and when you click on the software it starts running and here is a view of the uh, dashboard, essentially the environment um, for your Autodesk software that you will be using. Now if this is the first time that you're using this, a window will pop up the first time you t turn, you run your Autodesk and it will tell you that this is a trial version um, you could uh, either register your product if you already purchased it, if not you could try it for 30 days for free. Now one option is just to keep using it for 30 days for free but since you already in, uh, uh, have been registered as a student and you have a student license number then you click on the um, register option register your product option in that window and then it will take you to a another window that you will log in uh, with your username and password you put the product key and uh, the serial number that you acquired from the Autodesk page 
Okay, now that um, we talked about how to get access to the software that we'll be using in this class, that is 3DS uh, Max 2011 or 2010, um, let's uh, stop a little bit and um, talk about what we will be expecting in this class and how the class will be organized and, and uh, developed. As you know, this is an online class and the um, material and everything that you will uh, basically need will be posted to the Blackboard. And the first and important, uh, and one of the most important parts of the materials for this class is the class's syllabus. And the syllabus is essentially uh, in the Blackboard. You can find it under the Syllabus tab. And it talks about the course description, textbooks that uh, you will be um, using in the class, um, the software requirements, um, uh, the objectives of the class, and the evaluation criteria for your uh, performance within the class. Basically, a rough tentative outline of the topics that we will be covering uh, will be found in the syllabus as well, um, break, break, uh, uh, broken down to um, the weeks, um, and um, essentially you'll be uh, expecting what to see as the class progresses uh, throughout the semester from the syllabus. However, these topics are tentative um, according to uh, the uh, need or or essentially the interest, we can emphasize some of these topics uh, more or um, uh, reduce the amount of the time we spend on some other topics. You can find your general grading policies in the syllabus and you can see what you can expect according uh, to your grades throughout the semester. And uh, an important thing that I need to uh, emphasize is uh, to ask you to check the syllabus first before, if you have any questions about the class, um, before you contact your friends or, your, or the instructor about the question, because sp m maybe your questions, uh, the answer to your question uh, can be found in the syllabus and you won't have to wait for the response from um, other people um, while you have access to the syllabus 24-7. Uh, now let's go to the syllabus and let's see how it looks like and what are expected in the class. So as you know the class uh, is Art for Gaming and uh, the GMNG4317 is the class number uh, for spring 2011 um, and it is a purely internet based class. Um, this is a website that I try to maintain, um, basically putting some of the information about the class online, uh, but essentially you can find all of the information that you need about the class within the Blackboard. As most of you may know my name is Ali Reza Tavakoli, and um, I am located currently at room UC, which is University Center, building room 122-A. Uh, um, it previously was uh, the athletics office and they moved to the Jaguar, Jaguar Hall which is the uh, dormitory, new dormitory uh, uh, that was opened last semester uh, in fall of 2010 and we moved to uh, temporarily to, to this location. Um, the office hour f f hours for this class is from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. every Saturday uh, evening and please email me if this time is not convenient for you and if the majority of the students would like another time arranged uh, we can do that so we will meet online and I will post the meeting um, site uh, online and I will send an email uh, to everybody and you can come to this uh, meeting and we can discuss um, several topics um, if you have any questions and uh, uh, essentially that would be an hour that we'll be spending to get ourselves familiar with the uh, the class materials that uh, may be vague or hard to understand from the lectures. Most of the lectures will be given throughout videos and uh, if needed I will post extra materials on the blackboard as well. You can call me at 361-570-4204 which is my uh, 
office number or if you have any questions or concerns you can email me either by Bragboard or directly to my uh, email address that is uh, my last name followed by my first initial at uhv.edu and you probably already know how the emails are assigned in the university so in this class we will uh, talk about 3D animation, lighting, shading, texture. Uh, we'll try to see if we can fit sound also, digital sound in um, the uh, 3D animation, 3D modeling, and rendering of the artistic uh, designs within um, a uh, three-dimensional modeling program that we will use. And the program that we'll use is Autodesk 3DS Max Studios, um, which is useful for creating 3D models and 3D animations. There is no prerequisite for this class, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the only prerequisites that I think are essential is an interest in um, designing three-dimensional animation, three-dimensional uh, three-dimensional modeling, um, in uh, advanced computer graphics modeling uh, software and also um, essentially an interest in uh, creating uh, three-dimensional objects and working with computer graphics. In this class, we will want to see how we can um, work with three-dimensional graphics applications. Uh, we would want to understand three-dimensional modeling, shading, um, and graphics. Um, we will, towards the middle, in the end of the class, we'll start talking about animation and um, Essentially, all of the topics that we will work are done in Autodesk 3ds Max software. And the projects that we will have, and I'll talk about them a little bit, um, I encourage group projects. So please uh, arrange to um, have groups of two or three students and uh, meet with each other and do your projects in groups. That would be essentially a great uh, opportunity to improve your uh, interpersonal skills and also work uh, your your skills in um, essentially working with uh, groups. There are two textbooks uh, that are required for this class. The majority of the, the topic are uh, topics are essentially coming from harnessing the 3ds Max uh, 8 uh, by Aaron Ross and um, uh, Michelle Bosquet, um, and uh, you, the ISBN is essentially given here. You can look for it if you need to uh, purchase the book. Um, it's a 2006 uh, release and also I'll use the complimentary 3ds Max 8 relieve, uh, revealed book uh, that g shows you a lot of hands-on experience and lots of tutorial based topics. So I'm combining these two books essentially to give you a little bit of uh, behind the scene understanding of designing, developing, and working with three-dimensional graphics and an animation from the Harnessing 3ds Max book and then um, a combination of tutorials and, and um, uh, basically um, hands-on uh, materials that you could use from the 3ds uh, Max 8 revealed book um, and s some projects and, and, uh, and homeworks will be given from um, the second book. And there is a re recommended textbook that you don't have to have this textbook and um, but if you are interested in getting up a, a, a or, or getting a, a, a fast um, startup uh, you can use the beginning game art in 3ds Max um, and again I have the um, ISBN numbers for you to uh, look for the box essentially if there are several editions um, these ISBNs will give you the correct books. The technologies that we will be using are essentially Windows based. If you have Microsoft Windows 2007, Vista, or XP, you should be all right. I'm not sure if Linux would, would, would help you uh, install the 3ds Max. I have no idea. I haven't tried it. But if you do like to work with Linux, uh, check see if, if 3ds Max 2011 works uh, perfectly in. Um, in Linux. Um, the software is 3ds Max. You can use 8 through 11 student editions. The 11 and 10, as I showed you, are available for free for download uh, for st uh, to students um, through uh, Autodesk Education Program. 
so if you haven't done so yet either uh, after this syllabus talk uh, go ahead and do the um, the download and installation or after the, the lecture you can go ahead and install your, your software what you will see in the class are uh, four homeworks two projects one midterm and one final and the participation in the class is, is not mandatory it's just five percent extra credit uh, the percentage breakdown is basically thirty percent for the four homeworks fifteen percent for the two projects and twenty five percent for the midterm thirty percent for your final exam the homeworks would be a combination of um, questions and uh, uh, small three-dimensional small projects and the two projects will be essentially bigger ones that uh, they require uh, a group participation and we will work with them and talk about them throughout the class um, you have the grading scale if your grade is more than 90 uh, you will earn an A grades between 76 and 89 are B 62 to 40, 74 are assigned as a C uh, 50 to 61 is, is um, a D and anything less than 50 uh, unfortunately would get a um, grade of F my uh, late and missed work policy is essentially unless it is due to um, uh, extreme circumstances such as health issues and uh, things of that nature um, I won't accept uh, late homeworks um, however I have a late assignment um, uh, policy that uh, penal penalizes your grade according to the number of days that you will uh, y you return your grade late so uh, and and the uh, and penalty factor is 2 times n square percent of your final grade that is if n is the number of days that you're late your final grade will be multiplied by that uh, percentage point so let's assume that if you haven't uh, if you have returned your assignment on time and you're you're uh, not late uh, your modifier will be 1 that is if your grade was 92 it will be 92 if you're one day late your modifier is 96 percent that is if your grade was 92 um, otherwise it would be multiplied by 0 0.96 <coughs> that gives you a grade of 88 and two days late will earn you from the 92 a 72 77 if you're three days late your 92 would turn into a 59 if you're four days late your 92 would turn into a 33 and if you're five days and more late then the grade would be zero that would be a missed assignment the topics that you will cover essentially in this book are according to the week um, the first week we will talk about the introduction and how um, the um, 3s max basics work how the environment is set up um, in the second weeks we'll start with working inside the 3ds max environment then we'll move on to modeling we spend a couple of weeks on the modeling of the three-dimensional objects in 3ds max then we'll jump into materials and we'll see how materials are, are um, uh, designed and worked in 3ds max then I'll talk about cameras and lights and then we move on to keyframe animation at which point we start thinking about the midterm examination after the midterm um, we move to the topic of rendering and how we can work with uh, 3ds max to render the scenes that we created um, then we will move into the special effects and eventually we uh, end the class with advanced animation and advanced modeling and finally the last week of the class will be just for your for the final review or the final project and we will have a final exam at the end of the class throughout the class we could discuss the possibility of making the second project a major final project and um, replace the final exam with that final project so that is a possibility that uh, we can consider throughout the semester um, attendance and participations are not mandatory in the class however you need to check out frequently the topics and materials you need to be active there will be questions and uh, uh, small uh, modeling 
homework types of things, not necessarily major homeworks, but, uh, but simpler, smaller tasks that will be given at the end of each class, and you will have um, uh, to finish those to show that you have uh, read the material, you have listened to the lectures, and um, any other uh, activities or duties that you needed to um, uh, do in order to finish and participate in uh, each particular class. And this will end you earn you the 5% extra credit uh, uh, at the end of the class. Um, the other policies are essentially the policies that come from the university policies um, and student conduct uh, in terms of academic uh, integrity, um, plagiarism, its definition, and how to avoid it. Um, you can find those from the university website, and I have um, a few samples and a few uh, pointers here in the syllabus. Uh, for the students with <coughs> any kind of um, physical challenge, um, uh, you should contact the uh, university disability services office and uh, arrange for accommodations, and they would um, inform me as soon as possible as to uh, how we could arrange for uh, for the accommodations within the class. Um, if you need any services, you can contact the academic center. Basically, I have the website and, and the phone numbers and any other general policies that might pertain to student behavior and student conduct in the class. Now, you're not um, on campus, it's or you may be, but this class is an online class. So some of these policies may not directly um, be related, but essentially being a university student, it's good to know about all the policies about uh, how the university is governed and how the students are expected to interact with the classmates and, and the instructors and, and their class materials. Okay, uh, now that we um, learn how to acquire the 3DS Max and we talked about the syllabus, let's just start the basics of um, 3D graphics and 3D modeling that we will be covering in this class and, um, and move on with just an overview of the, uh, the backgrounds and the behind the scenes of um, 3D modeling and animation and throughout the course we just take on um, the topics and the techniques that I will be talking about today and we dissect them further and we investigate a lot more uh, details about the techniques that we could use and also some uh, hand-on experiences in terms of uh, developing and applying uh, each of these techniques. Now the objectives of uh, the rest of today's uh, topics is essentially um, to start up with uh, learning the main phases of a three-dimensional uh, production or a three-dimensional project and we'll talk about how we can use um, each step to enhance uh, the outcome of the project. Uh, then we talk about key three-dimensional concepts what they are in each of them and how they can be implemented and manipulated and you probably have some backgrounds some of you may have some backgrounds about um, basics of some of the topics that I will be talking about next we talk about the common terms that are used in 3D um, software development 3D software um, packages that we'll use we we'll learn about the basics of 2D bitmap images what they are how what properties do they possess and how we can use them in our three-dimensional applications. We check out uh, the um, Autodesk 3ds Max 2011 environment that we just downloaded and we uh, basically uh, work a little bit with the basic elements and basic, uh, uh, basic uh, m modules that are in its default environment and essentially we get ready, get ourselves ready uh, for our 3ds Max journey and uh, creating artistic uh, applications uh, within the uh, digital simulation and three-dimensional uh, modeling software uh, softwares and in particular with the 3ds Max. When you're working in a 3D software um, you require to think in, in new ways although uh, we live in three-dimensional world um, 
that we may be very much accustomed to how we can we see things in three dimensions, um, but we may not be as easily um, uh, comfortable with uh, the actual creation of these three-dimensional objects. Uh, it will take a little bit of mm, uh, practice to essentially be able to um, uh, get really comfortable in developing three-dimensional um, objects or, or working in three-dimensional uh, uh, worlds. The creation of these three-dimensional objects is a very complex process, and there are it, it can take a lot of time to essentially uh, finalize a three-dimensional project or, or a three-dimensional uh, production. To get ourselves um, a little bit more comfortable with the processes, we would break down a three-dimensional project into several steps and several uh, uh, terms and we define them and then we will uh, address each of those issues uh, that comes up in, in a three-dimensional production um, in its own merits. So here I have a few uh, terms that I will just briefly describe and then I, I will delve into more uh, details about each of these terms and then throughout the uh, uh, course of the term uh, in this semester we will see how, what these things are, what these terms are actually essentially are, um, we get um, a good hands-on experience in terms of working with each of each each, each of these concepts, and then uh, we uh, build upon our uh, knowledge and experiences in terms of developing developing three-dimensional graphics. Um, the first and most important part of a of a three-dimensional uh, graphics essentially. Um, or a three-dimensional project is a pre-production phase, and in the pre-production phase is essentially a part of the project that is before you uh, you start uh, getting your hands dirty with um, the technical uh, aspects and the technical issues. Uh, one of the important uh, components and important things in the pre-production uh, um, is um, a concept called reference materials, and I'll talk about that uh, the reference materials in detail. Essentially, any type of study and research that you will do about the topic the object that you're creating or, or you're uh, modeling uh, would help you in, in terms of advancing your, your uh, portfolio or your um, repertoire of reference materials for that particular object. The next topic that we encounter is called scenes and essentially what they are, scenes are basically the collection of elements that can be combined together to create a visual illusion which, which we call computer graphics or we could call this um, a, a virtual environment. Um, we'll talk about the scenes a little bit more. Uh, next topic that uh, 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 undoubtedly in any three-dimensional uh, uh, graphics application you would come across uh, uh, to is the topic of modeling. Basically creating three-dimensional representatives of the geometry of the objects that you are creating in the um, computer graphics application, any computer graphics application from computer games to uh, to digital movies and things like that um, is called modeling and there are several techniques uh, to model and some of the m techniques are more suitable for particular applications and particular geometries um, than, than some others and we'll discuss those throughout the semester. There are several uh, uh, modeling techniques and tools from the um, simple mo uh, geometrical modeling to very advanced modeling and we will see those uh, in this class. Um, once you, you have your geometry, uh, uh, geometrical or geometry of your objects modeled and created, your objects look very bland and they don't look uh, um, at all like the three-dimensional uh, object that you had in mind. Next step is to apply materials and maps on your objects, essentially give your objects visual qu uh, qualities um, such as their colors, their shininess, their bumpiness, and many other different types of uh, visual properties such as, their, such as the reflective, like reflectiveness property of the objects and so forth. And these are uh, applied through um, materials and maps. And those of you who have taken um, uh, computer graphics or gaming classes, you already uh, are familiar with uh, some basic uh, maps and material uh, techniques and tools and we'll study them in this class as well. Um, when you have your maps and materials, of course your objects would still look pretty dull and uh, the reason is that in real world we don't just see 
objects' colors. We see the interaction of the objects' colors um, or, or materials with the light uh, in the environment, and those uh, interactions between lights and colors um, and materials on the objects would create the realistic looking uh, or physically realistic looking uh, materials and, and, uh, yeah, and objects in our uh, visual world. So um, uh, lights and cameras essentially are, are uh, very important in terms of giving a particular uh, tone or setting a particular mood for your uh, computer graphics, the three-dimensional computer graphics application including uh, the three-dimensional modeling of, of the objects. Um, we'll talk about those a little bit more um, today, and then we uh, enhance on uh, lightings and cameras, essentially, further throughout the, cor uh, the course. The next topic uh, talks about um, those kinds of three-dimensional applications that are not just still images. Uh, so you would have either uh, the scene that is evolving and changing over time, and you might have objects that are moving within the scene. Animation is responsible for creating that kinds of uh, dynamic scenes or moving scenes, um, such as a computer game, essentially is um, an animation. And of course, movies uh, are non-interactive animations. Um, once you have set up your entire scene in the production, the final stage of your production is basically to draw everything out, and that is the phase that's basically responsible for rendering of your um, your animation or your three-dimensional scenes or models, and we'll talk about those in detail. Now let's go back to the pre-production phase of your um, animation. Basically, when you talk about production, you simply think of producing something and in terms of your computer graphics the production means the the basically the way that you you create a motion picture or create a computer game or create any other three-dimensional three computer graphics so that entire package is basically what you produce and you create but before you you embark on the process of producing something you would have to essentially plan and design ahead. And pre-production is about all the tasks that you, you as the art, artist would take before you start developing your computer graphics application. And this means uh, um, basically planning ahead and doing um, uh, some, giving some thoughts about what, uh, what project you're, you're dealing with, then going on and studying about the project that you're working with, and then start designing it. In simple um, productions, such as a com simple computer game, um, you would go about and do uh, lots of research about objects that you're creating, the way the models look like, uh, how these models should be represented, what are the properties of the models, and so forth. When you're talking about a more, a more advanced uh, production, such as the production of a movie, and things that are uh, a lot more costly than you would have to take into account the amount of work that each production would take, how much uh, budget you would have to allocate for um, each step of the project, and so it would become a lot more uh, um, um, detailed and um, a lot more involved. So um, all of these tasks and topics are basically fall within the uh, pre-production phase of your project. Um, so for example, if you're uh, um, trying to design and, and create three-dimensional model of a car, then you, 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 you know what car you're modeling, then you go online, you uh, do a little research about how this car looks like, what different components this car has, what is the um, size of the car, the different um, uh, relative sizes of different parts of the car uh, with respect to other parts and components and uh, the texture of the car. You download a whole bunch of images from several cars of that type and then um, you basically try to understand what, what this is. All these things that you study are essentially all the material studies and research that you um, do during the pre-production phase of your project is basically the reference materials that you could use to help yourself with a solid understanding of the design of the object and that would help you in terms of producing or the production phase. You see if you don't know what different components your the object you're creating has, if you don't know uh, what kind of texture this object might have, you eventually don't know how to develop this project or this, this um, um, this model. And, and here's the, the phase and the materials that you would use later on throughout your, uh, your project. Now we talked about the pre-production phase of your project. Now it's a time to start working on 
on the project and the production. In computer graphics, um, scene is like basically a scene in a movie or, or a film. You have collections of elements that you combine them to create this virtual environment or a visual illusion rather because these objects don't really uh, uh, exist in a world but they are m a mathematical representations of the reality that you model, created, and rendered. So these objects are basically virtual objects and um, we call them virtual to distinguish them from the real world objects. Um, in a uh, computer graphics scene you usually find uh, lots of virtual objects, some of which may be uh, moving, some of them uh, may be static, some of them may be a part of the environment. Um, also the scene um, defines how these objects would look and interact with, with each other based on the surface properties that they have, the types of lighting that you have created, and also the positions of your cameras. Basically all of these components would um, uh, create and uh, an influence the scene. Sometimes you call these scenes productions, essentially. They are um, the, the things that uh, you pr produce as a video game or a, or a movie or any other uh, three-dimensional computer graphics application, like a, um, a, a, a modeling of an architectural building and then a walkthrough of the building and so forth. These are all called productions or essentially scenes. Um, so, um, in 3ds Max, um, though, these scenes are uh, stored in uh, one single file with an extension .max or .max, and these files, uh, this file contains um, uh, basically all the package that encapsulates nearly everything that is related to um, the construction of the scene, all the data and the um, combinations and interactions between, between several uh, objects that is, is eventually rendered into the scene uh, file called dot .max. If you have two-dimensional images such as textures, m um, uh, texture maps and things like that, uh, materials and maps, they are not rendered into the scene and they are stored as separate files. Um, that's the only difference. And um, the neat thing about 3ds Max uh, uh, as opposed to other three-dimensional computer graphics applications is that um, all three-dimensional uh, scene-related uh, components that I just um, talked about uh, will be uh, essentially rendered and put in uh, the one single .max file. In three-dimensional graphic programs, objects don't really exist. They are just a mathematical representation of your uh, your objects, the real objects, or we call them geometric representations or models. Um, models is simpler than geometrical representations. On the other hand, sometimes people refer to models as geometry. So for example, in terms of an architectural scene, you don't call it an architectural model, you just call it the geometry of the scene. And, and that's essentially the same thing. And um, the art of making these three-dimensional objects is called modeling. Sometimes it's kind of difficult to start beginning to think um, three-dimensional uh, modeling and uh, there are various uh, techniques, a number of techniques actually, that can be used to create three-dimensional models. Some of these techniques are more efficient in some cases and, and modeling of some, uh, specific types of geometries than others and we will um, see uh, a few of these, uh, these topics and techniques in terms of uh, three-dimensional modeling, some of which you may have already used in other uh, three-dimensional applications such as Maya, but we will study them from the basic to the more complicated in this class uh, using 3ds Max. Essentially, um, if you look at the um, object in this uh, uh, slide, this is essentially a model. It's a three-dimensional mesh representation or a polygonal uh, representation of a uh, a tiger. Um, so, um, simply called uh, its model. You have several different uh, approaches to create this model. Some of them may be m uh, more suitable for this particular um, object, which is basically representing it with the polygonal meshes. Once you have your um, objects modeled, 
um, you will notice, as you s noticed in the previous slide, in the object of in, in the model of the tiger that I showed you, um, or a female lion, uh, you wouldn't be able to distinguish uh, about what this object is because it's basically a dull-looking gray, solid gray uh, object. It's just a sculpture, and um, basically to add more. Um, realism to your models, you would have to give these models some visual qualities such as their colors, their shininess, their bumpiness, and other types of uh, properties um, such as their reflection uh, and the amount of transparency they have and also um, if they have textures, the, the patterns and the textures that they, uh, that they need. These visual qualities can be uh, applied to your models um, through the use of materials. Uh, materials are essentially the paint or the wallpaper paper that you applied on the objects in your scene. And they could, as I mentioned, uh, represent the color, shininess, texture, transparency, reflect reflection, reflectiveness, and, and, um, and bumpiness of your, um, the, the surface of your object. Sometimes you apply materials um, differently. So the simplest way to apply materials is to pick a surface, apply a material to it, pick another surface, surface, apply another material to it. Another way to create materials is essentially through mapping or texture mapping. Um, so this is a, a different way of applying materials. Um, you can basically scan um, the materials or if you have an, an image for the material you can draw it and then you apply this material by putting it in a map that represents all the surfaces of your object and then um, paste this entire material or map onto your uh, your object. Um, this is very important in terms of uh, creating effective illusions in your computer graphics. Um, sometimes there are very fine details um, that you cannot effe effectively or efficiently uh, model them through geometrical approaches and geometrical modeling. Uh, one such important um, illusion or such important property of uh, the surfaces, uh, the surfaces of many objects, is um, the imperfections that is on the surface of the object. So, if you look at a wall, you would notice that there are lots of little bumps on, on the surface that do not follow any particular um, geometrical patterns and there's quite a few of them. So uh, one way to do it is to model geometrically all of those little bumps or if you look at the surface of an orange you see lots of little holes in the orange, lots of little pores in, on, the, on the surface of the orange. So realistically it's impossible to think of modeling all those um, imperfections and the pores and bumps on the surface geometrically. Um, there are uh, normal maps and bump maps that you could apply on top of your material and kind of fake this, uh, this illusion of your material being imperfect and having um, um, random bumps and, and pores on, 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 on its surface. And these can be made uh, very, very efficiently because essentially what they are is that they're not m more complicated or more um, um, uh, expensive to create than just a simple mat material and you can apply them to, to the material and efficiently in, in runtime you can apply these entire um, uh, uh, visual illusions on your object whereas if you wanted to model them geometrically you would have to create a lot more polygons on your model and your rendering machine or the, the rendering process would take a lot more time to create these geometrical uh, reconstructions of those imperfections and, and, and the visual illusions that you could uh, otherwise very easily give through um, uh, texture maps and normal maps. Even if you apply all your materials and your, your maps um, on the surface, you would still notice that um, in a particular computer graphics application such as um, 3ds Max, your materials look very, very uh, uh, shallow, essentially. Um, they, they wouldn't look realistic because we as humans uh, use, are, are used to uh, looking at objects in the presence of some sort of light. And what we will see is not just the color of the object or the texture of an object, um, but rather the interaction between the surface of the object with 
its particular material that it has uh, with uh, different lights that hits its surface and the reflections of other lights coming from other materials and objects um, that are hitting the surface and then the portion of the light that uh, that receives in our eye. So that's the way that we will see the world. And in order to create re realistic looking objects and scenes, you would have to consider lights, essentially. And basically uh, be able to um, apply specific kinds of lighting uh, in specific types of um, situations and, and locations, and then um, let the uh, rendering machine take care of the interactions of uh, the lights with the surface of the objects. And then uh, the objects would basically come to life. Essentially, lights are responsible for giving photorealistic looks to your objects rather than just having simple materials. Um, <coughs> One thing to, to consider is that lighting is an approximation of the real uh, uh, world bidirectional light rendering equation. Um, one of the techniques that is very good, a very good approximation is just ray tracing. Uh, we uh, uh, probably won't use ray tracing tools and techniques because it's a very, very uh, complicated and complex process. It's very time consuming because it's an in, in, uh, iterative process and for each uh, uh, fragment of the scene that you will see, it, it, it iterates through various uh, reflections and re-reflections of lights from various surfaces that hits and goes, passes through that fragment and enters the eye of the viewer which would be done through the uh, uh, establishment of cameras, and I'll talk about that a little bit um, later. Nonetheless, um, whatever um, uh, lighting scenario that you choose, from simple fog lighting models to very complicated ray tracing techniques, uh, you would notice that you could create uh, amazing uh, photorealism by applying uh, the correct lighting and appropriate lighting to your objects. Um, so, for example, if you're creating a um, scary uh, m movie or, or a scary kind of scene for your computer game, uh, you would probably pick um, darker um, areas and um, lights which are a lot more uh, contrasting, whereas if you're creating a smooth uh, transitional scene, you probably pick up uh, lights with m uh, much warmer colors and um, with less contrast, so things would uh, look a lot more smooth. Uh, so that's th that, that depends on, um, on the uh, artist and type of application that you are creating. So, as I said, uh, the computer graphic scenes are all about being seen. And with your models, you would just see the geometry of your objects. Applying materials, you'd see the uh, material of the object but doesn't look real because it doesn't interact with any light. You put lighting to bring realism to your uh, scenes and to your objects, bring them to life um, essentially. Uh, but the last portion of creating your scene essentially is, um, or the uh, next to last, is to setting up the cameras. Without cameras there won't be any viewers and they won't be able to see the objects. So models, three-dimensional geometrical models, model the objects in a three-dimensional world of the computer graphics. But the interaction and the relation between the models and the viewers is not established unless you put a camera in, um, in the scene that watches the model and the scene. And that's what observers of your, your 3D uh, uh, graphics um, will see through the eyes of the camera. So the cameras establish the viewpoints of your audiences. And so you could set up several cameras, you could set up um, uh, any types of um, uh, viewing mechanism from perspective to um, uh, orthographic, different types of focal lengths for your cameras, and all that kind of things, you can set them up essentially as if you had a real camera taking a picture of a real world and then wanting to show people um, that picture. So those can be done through the uh, process of providing cameras to your, um, to your scene. Another uh, important aspect of using cameras in your computer graphics is that not only do they represent the viewpoints of your audiences and give your scenes um, realistic representation um, the way that people usually see 
uh, in the world um, according to the, the, the way that our eyes would basically capture images from the world um, is that they provide the rendering process an efficient way to create the scene or essentially draw the final product of the scene if there is an object or anything that's outside the viewpoint of, uh, or, or the view field of your camera your viewers will not be able to see it therefore there's no need to render it and there's no need to create it so in, in this um, aspect uh, cameras would help limit the amount of rendering and processing that your um, renderer would have to go through by limiting everything within the visual view frame of your camera and so the renderer would just render that part of the scene now if the camera moves and now some other part of the scene is vis visible then that part will be rendered by the rendering mechanism and all the other parts that are not being seen b by the camera and therefore by the viewers will not be um, rendered and that would increase the uh, speed of the processing of your computer graphics application sometimes your um, production is beyond just a simple still image of an object sitting somewhere uh, it may contain uh, moving objects moving cameras and interactions and dynamic uh, uh, objects within the scene uh, animation would take care of and this dynamism and essentially would make objects move objects move relative to each other and objects move relative to the scene or cameras move around the scene uh, one of the simplest um, applications of animation is essentially uh, animated movies or computer games and so in computer games you can't not have a static object or a static scene it's inherently animated there are two different types of uh, creating animations. Um, the first type is called keyframing, and the second part that is uh, a more advanced animation it involves uh, forward or inverse kinematics um, to essentially calculate or make the equations of m movements of different parts of an, a, a multi-part object and um, essentially create um, repetitive and non-rigid motions such as motions of um, complex characters like humans and uh, animals and, 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 and cars and things like that. Um, uh, we won't talk about for, uh, inverse kinematics and forward kinematics until uh, later on in the semester when we talk about uh, uh, character animation and we'll see how we can animate through um, a process um, of rigging um, a, a character and also the inverse kinematics of creating animation using bones and things like that. Uh, but the simplest form of animation is essentially the keyframing animation and um, the idea here is that you will create important uh, uh, frames, essentially important snapshots of your animation, and you call them keys. So those would be your key frames. And once you have those important snapshots, uh, for example, uh, one of the snapshots here in the picture could be the very leftmost uh, and, and topmost part of that uh, m falling uh, uh, elastic ball is one keyframe and the second keyframe is the lowest um, uh, and, and the leftmost and, 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 and the lowest uh, position of the ball that's a vertical the a horizontal ellipse and then the next keyframe is um, when it reaches its peak and throughout its course that's the middle part and then the next keyframe would be the bottom the second bottom part and so on and so forth so you create these keyframes as to how your objects look like how your scene uh, uh, looks like within that snapshot uh, these are called basically your keyframes and then you fill in the between um, the in between frames so um, sometimes in, uh, in in like the early uh, days of animations um, the keyframe animators would create the keyframes and then um, the uh, junior artists would fill in the rest of the frames and then you would put them together and then you would see the animation. Uh, nowadays in 3ds Max you de define the keyframes, you define the equations uh, and, the, and, and the involvement of the, the development of the in-between frames and then your 3ds Max essentially would uh, simulate these in-between frames how your scene or your objects would look like and 
uh, puts them together and creates the animations for you. And the final part of your three-dimensional computer graphics is the rendering part. Um, basically, rendering means that you would uh, draw a representation of something. And um, so in the three-dimensional computer graphics, um, you can use computers to do the rendering. Essentially, what you will do is that you create your three-dimensional models, you create um, the, the materials and lights, you create all the maps that you need, reflection maps, bump maps, and all the other types of maps that uh, are applied to the several um, um, parts of the scene. And when the scene is done, then your computer takes all the scene information, such as materials, lights to calculate the interactions, and so on and so forth, the animation information, if there are moving objects, and then it renders the scene. You can have a still image production or a moving uh, um, images production. Um, so when you do the rendering by three-dimensional graphics, like a 3ds Max um, program, if you don't have an animated scene, it would put all the rendered images into a 3ds Max file. If you have an animated scene, then each frame of the movie is stored on a separate file on your computer disk, disk and you, it, it is given a, a specific number and those files, the sequence of images, are called the image sequence. You can put them together as a movie and, and show them, or you could give them to a um, game engine and so on and so forth. Your rendering can be real-time, essentially for computer games. Um, that means that each frame basically have to be rendered um, with real-time um, constraints. That is, for people who are watching the frame to not be able to see um, flickers in, in the, um, in the, in the um, uh, animation. Uh, each frame has, basically your computer graphics application should be able to render at least 30 frames a second. For this kind of constraint, you would notice that your renderer should start decreasing the quality of the um, the graphics. Essentially, it wouldn't be as photorealistic as you would uh, like it to be um, compared to an actual uh, real um, uh, movie that is shot from a real uh, scene. Um, but as the computer graphics cards speed um, and, and memory um, advances and, and gets faster and, um, and larger, um, that kind of qu uh, quality wouldn't be uh, of, of a great uh, concern and especially the advances in computer graphics and the lighting uh, and the rendering um, topics now essentially lets us render um, computer graphics that are really really realistic looking such as the Quake or Unreal um, games um, done in the Unreal Engine. On the other hand when you um, would like to create something of very good quality, such as creating an animated movie, uh, you probably would require a lot more processing in the rendering mechanism, and there you would have to make your rendering offline. And that is for each frame, your uh, rendering mechanism might take um, several minutes or hours to finish the rendering, but the final product will be a very, very high quality image, such as the image that you will see rendered from this um, uh, imaginary um, house and, and the car and so forth. Um, so it took um, a lot more uh, than a fraction of a second to render this scene, but the scene looks a lot more realistic because the re rendering and, and the equations that are applied are a lot more involved and a lot more complicated and they take a lot more time, but still the image is an, a very realistic looking image. Okay, so far I talked about three-dimensional applications. In order to help us with our three-dimensional applications, um, especially for example for the cases that I was talking about, uh, having texture maps or, or materials and, and bump maps and things like that, uh, sometimes you would need to use uh, two-dimensional images, um, basically to um, um, work with um, the surfaces of our objects in three-dimensional applications. Also, because two-dimensional images are a lot more, uh, a lot easier to to get a handle on, um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the two-dimensional um, graphics. 
and um, give you uh, some pointers about the topics that you might not already know and s most of it you already know and then we will um, talk about how these two-dimensional images uh, may or may not be used and the techniques in two-dimensional uh, uh, imaging may or may not be used to help us with the development of three-dimensional graphics. First off, two-dimensional images are gen generally called bitmaps and uh, basically the bitmap is a file that contains um, a number of um, uh, pixels, basically a grid of pixels that are put on a uh, mosaic um, and um, and essentially they are uh, the smallest elements of a picture which is which is basically um, a, a pixel uh, the abbreviation for picture elements um, in uh, each pixel can contain um, either one value uh, that represents its intensity or it could have um, several values according to the uh, color channels it could have um, red green and blue channels for RGB uh, colors and then each pixel can have uh, essentially um, uh, from 8 per channel to 24 per channel uh, bits uh, representing it its, uh, its, its value that gives us as little as 20, uh, 256 uh, different colors all the way up to uh, 16 million colors. Um, each, pix each image has a or, or bitmap has a resolution. A resolution is a sum essentially the number of pixels that are um, in the image uh, in terms of its rows and columns. So a 400 by um, 200 uh, image uh, has 400 pixels in each row and uh, for each column it contains three, uh, 200, mm -hmm, 200 pixels. Um, the, for images that are scanned there's another notion that talks about the resolution and that is pixel per, uh, per inch that tells you how many pixels is in uh, one square inch of um, image or how many pixel is in one linear inch of, an, of the, the scanned image. Um, the bitmaps also have a uh, alpha channel that represents the transparency of the image uh, or object um, at, um, at that pixel and um, finally we can use um, image editing tools and techniques to edit the two-dimensional bitmaps that we have uh, and apply them as color maps or texture maps or uh, other types of maps to our materials or we could use compositing techniques to combine multiple images um, for example in terms of creating a uh, unified scene we have a scene of a, a tiger and a scene of uh, a, an empty jungle and can composite these two images according to their alpha channels or transparencies for each object and create um, the uh, scene that shows us the tiger uh, that is in that uh, jungle jungle scene. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the details of bitmaps and what they are and how they um, are represented. Uh, essentially, as I said, a bitmap is an image. It contains uh, a grid of colored uh, dots which are called pixels for pixel ele picture element and it's the smallest element of an image um, and it's just one small cell of the image so if you look at uh, your monitor and you get very very close to your monitor you would see that the uniform um, patterns that you see they break down into uh, small s uh, square shape um, uh, elements or uh, or dots essentially each of those are a pixel um, so um, uh, basically your bitmap images are flat 2D images and you could use these 2D images for materials and backgrounds as I said earlier to apply on the surfaces of your three-dimensional images to create three-dimensional computer graphics. Um, finally when your images are rendered the rendered result is also uh, stored into a uh, bitmap file. There are different file formats for uh, bitmap files file formats can vary from the Windows bitmap with the .bmp um, extension to TrueVision, Targa, TGA um, and um, tagged image file format that's .tif and finally the joint picture photographic experts group um, that's called the JPEG images. So um, the only differences that you do have within this uh, um, different formats is the way that they represent data and of course the compression techniques that they use in terms of representing your two-dimensional um, data in um, their corresponding file. The resolution in image is essentially, or in, or in bitmap, is essentially the amount of pixels that are within the rows and the columns of pixels on an image. Um, you cannot um, 
basically divide your uh, pictures smaller than its individual pixels. So um, the number of pixels that you have will essentially pile up together and create the amount of uh, the, the resolution that your image has. Now, in general, higher resolution images um, are potentially sharper and crisper because they hold a lot more information than lower resolution images. So if you have a 640 by 480 image, it's less um, sharp than a 1024 by 768 uh, pixel uh, or resolution image. When you're scanning an image or you're printing it, each pixel basically occupies some size and um, on, on the page. That is the measure of pixel per inch or PPI that tells you how many pixels are packed in a square inch of your printed image. So if you have a low PPI um, image, your um, printers are basically larger than an image that has the same res resolution but higher PPI. So for example, uh, a setting of 72 PPI results in bigger pixels than a 600 PPI and so the images that are printed on 600 PPI would look crisper but they also would look smaller in print. Your bitmap images contain um, uh, channels and generally they are divided into three channels for each primary color. The primary color are basically the colors that can create any other color. We are familiar with the primary red, yellow and blue colors that are basically the colors that we use in terms of the paint um, mixing and creating image, uh, uh, creating um, 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 paintings. Um, in theory in the computer color uh, space um, the colors are red, green, and blue, and that comes from the additive color. The reason for, for the difference between the painting color and the, um, uh, the light color is that the painting colors are subtractive colors because what we see in terms of the color of a paint is the amount or, or, or the channel or the uh, wavelength of the uh, light observable light or visible light that is reflected from the, um, the the paint. So if you have a paint that looks blue, the reason that it is blue is that when the light, white light hits the surface, it absorbs all the other colors and reflects the blue. That is a subtractive color space. In terms of the light though, when you're looking at a red light, all light that is that this light basically is made of is just the red light, not um, the reflection of a white light uh, over a red object. Um, the, in, in terms of the light combination, the light is considered to be an additive RGB space, whereas the paint um, colors are considered to be subtractive color space. So when you add the uh, red, yellow, and blue of the paint color space or subtractive color space together, you'd get black. That is that the addition of all these uh, colors would absorb all the visible light and no light would be reflected back. Whereas the addition of RGB or red, green, blue light in the additive uh, color space would result in uh, the white light, which is all the spectrums of the, uh, the different colors of light in the visible light. So essentially, in uh, computer graphics and imaging, we use the additive light. Basically, um, we have three primary RGB colors that would uh, create all possible lights that we need to create. For each channel, we could assign a various uh, depth, and that's called the bit depth of an image. It determines how much information can be stored in the... the um, the image essentially. So if you have an 8-bit um, depth image, you have 256 possible values from 0 to 255 and therefore for an RGB image you can have 24 bits, that is 8 bits per channel and your image can have 24 possible uh, uh, colors and that results in about 16 million uh, different colors that you could represent with 8-bit RGB space. This is called true color because um, to our uh, uh, eyes, 
uh, the differentiation between 16 million colors is very very difficult so essentially we could create all the colors that are uh, that human visual um, apparatus can perceive with the 24 bits 8 bits per color channel there is another uh, color uh, space that uh, can be used in um, the um, 3D graphics and that's called hue saturation or luminance that's HLS or uh, interchangeably hue saturation value or HSV so what RGB does is that for each channel you have a different color or a different amount of R G or B for HSV your channels are a little bit different the H channel represents the hue of the um, the color basically for example red is a hue blue is a hue and so you have various hues from dark blue all the way uh, through red and green and yellow back to violet uh, hues saturation would tell you how much of that hue this um, this color has so s low saturations like zero tend to be darker of the hue and so a, a, a saturation of zero represents black a saturation uh, saturation of one represents the red the, the the most amount of that that particular hue that you have for example a red color is the red most um, color if it's uh, it's very saturated and value represents the amount of um, color that essentially um, you uh, your um, basically the brightness of the color that's what it is so um, uh, a luminance of zero again is basically a, a, a zero um, value uh, and it's black uh, and a luminance of uh, one which is a maximum luminance or maximum value uh, uh, would be representing a complete white color so these are the different uh, color spaces that are used in uh, bitmap images. Now that you know about what bitmap images are and how they are represented, um, notice that we could use these bitmap images for our backgrounds, for our, uh, maps and materials and all different kinds of things that we would like to apply, um, such as texture maps, on uh, the surface of, surfaces of our three-dimensional objects. Uh, you could create these bitmaps from scratch or you could just go ahead and download them from the web or take a picture with a digital camera and download it. Once you have that, you would actually need to edit this uh, bitmap files to either enhance their colors, sharpen their contrast, um, or essentially to remove unwanted elements. Let's say that you wanted to create a texture of a grass on the surface uh, of a three-dimensional uh, patch of ground. Um, uh, what you could do is that you could go ahead and take a picture of a uh, a lawn. Now, when you take a picture of a lawn, you'd have the grass, you'd have other kinds of elements. Um, essentially, you cannot just take a picture of the grass. And uh, so you'd need to um, kind of process these things out. And um, maybe the uh, um, lighting condition might not be good. Maybe you have shadows that you might want to get rid of. And so you could process them uh, with uh, several image editing um, software packages such as GIMP which is a free software package uh, Photoshop, MS Paint and all the other kinds of software pack packages. There are also image processing tools and techniques that you could use um, for example within the um, OpenCV um, package which is a free um, computer vision and image processing package you have several uh, functions that you could use in C++ to uh, do any sort of uh, image processing on your um, two-dimensional bitmap files. Once you have them, then you can apply those bitmap files to your images. In some non-interactive productions, such as films or video, um, sometimes you want to m put multiple images and combine them together uh, through a process that's called uh, compositing. Let's say that, um, as I mentioned earlier, you have uh, an object that is uh, that you have a um, a model for and then you have an, a scene that you have created and then you want to put these two together and um, create um, a, a more realistic looking scene. Uh, this can be done through um, image compositing and uh, uh, there are some compositing programs that you could use and uh, basically replace some specific kinds of color like a green color or a blue, co 
blue color um, to replace um, that co color with um, an entire uh, different scene or, or an object. That is called chroma key process and uh, if you n notice in terms of the um, uh, news studios usually they do have a uh, white or a green uh, background where the uh, anchors and, and uh, uh, news specialists are uh, sitting in front of and then they would put images and videos on that blue screen and it would replace the blue screen with the background that they created from a different video or a different image. You could use the same process through compositing programs and um, there is another uh, uh, effective reason in especially computer graphics to use compositing um, in that uh, sometimes you could create the entire scene and put all the objects within the scene and, and use everything um, at the same time. And the problem with it is that first of all the process of rendering is becomes um, 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 very time consuming and secondly if you need to change a part of the scene then you have to change that for example if you need to change the properties of an object such as the ch color of a car then you'd have to change the color of the car and render the entire scene which becomes um, a, a bottleneck in, in terms of the production. Another way to do this is to create different models and different objects of the scene separately and have them in separate uh, uh, production files and then if you would like to change anything about each, each of those objects you just need to change that part of the object and render that object only and give all these objects into a compositing program and then let the uh, compositing pro program put everything together and um, essentially uh, create the final scene. Uh, there are many compositing programs of this kind and Autodesk is um, uh, basically uses cutting-edge uh, compositing techniques uh, for example there's a combustion program which runs on wi windows and um, it could use essentially uh, different objects and, and combine them uh, together to create a scene okay after the, all that long talk about how to download the Autodesk uh, 3ds Max and install it and then the talks about the talk about the, the uh, syllabus of the class and uh, essentially the, uh, these little backgrounds about three-dimensional uh, programs and applications this is now the time to start working with other uh, with our um, 3ds Max essentially and start uh, getting comfortable with the environment so what we will do in the next few minutes is we load the 3ds Max I'll show you how to um, um, look at different viewports and check out the viewports to see what they have to offer and then I'll show you how you can work uh, within the viewports to create several objects that are already um, uh, default object types in um, the um, Autodesk 3ds Max uh, such as spheres, boxes and things like that and then we'll manipulate viewports we see how we can zoom in, pan and uh, maximize viewports and work with them and also how to manipulate objects such as moving them, scaling them, rotating them and this kind of simple processes feel free to work um, more on, on this topics until next week and uh, next week we'll start working uh, a little bit more within the, the 3ds Max to create simple objects, apply materials and things of that nature and then we can start working um, on uh, three-dimensional modeling in 3ds Max and I'll again uh, give you side-by-side -side views of um, how to do this, why uh, this is important, how it's done and what's the backgrounds of it and then I'll complement it with a uh, quick tutorial and an example of that particular kinds of modeling and this would be probably the theme throughout the semester we'll learn a little bit background and then we get some um, uh, some hands-on experience because uh, this way it won't be just a um, merely um, tutorial kind of approach uh, in that you would know how to do some particular thing but you won't know why it is done the way it is done and um, basically if you need to elaborate more and create more complicated and advanced things then you won't have a clue and also just going through and having all these background topics it becomes boring because after all this is a uh, class that we want to learn how to do things within the class and so I try to combine a healthy dose of both of the two worlds so that it would engage your curiosity and um, your understanding and at the same time it would help you uh, work 
and get your hands dirty with the uh, stuff in the uh, 3DS Max. Of course, the um, other uh, text uh, recommended textbook, uh, which talks about the um, um, the, the 3DS Max um, essentially tutorials, uh, which is the 3DS Max 8 re uh, revealed, uh, contains a lot of tutorials that you could just go on and, and study and work with. And every once in a while, I'll just put um, a tutorial up and, and I'll ask you to uh, uh, work on it as a, as a part of a homework or, or uh, a small project and things like that. So this being said, uh, let's start working with the actual 3ds Max and let's just go in and see how this um, uh, this software package looks like and how things are done in the software package. Okay, when you go on um, the start button and then click on programs and then find Autodesk and click on 3ds Max 2011, the uh, 3ds Max 2011 student version opens and here the first file that's created for you is um, named untitled as you can see up here. Um, this is the default view of the 3ds Max. It is composed of four viewports. The top viewport which is the top left section of the screen, the front viewpoint, four viewport is the top right section, the bottom left section is the left viewport, and the perspective viewport is essentially your bottom right section of the uh, screen. So this is how it looks like. You can left click on each of the viewports and as you see they will be selected and if you zoom in and out with uh, scroll uh, button on the mouse. So if you scroll up, you zoom in. If you scroll down, you zoom out in each of the um, orthographic viewports. And um, in this uh, perspective viewport, again, you can zoom in and out with the uh, mouse scroll. So we'll use the perspective viewport here and uh, we left click on the lower um, right portion of the screen to highlight the perspective uh, viewport. So if you look at the right corner of the screen you see the uh, viewport controls and these are essentially the icons that you can uh, use uh, to control the viewports. So if you move your mouse on each of these icons the tooltip appears so the magnifier is zoom the magnifier over all viewports is zoom all. The next is zoom extent of the viewport. Zoom extent all. And then field of view, pan view, orbit, and maximize viewport toggle. If you click on maximize viewport toggle, the active viewport gets maximized. And if you um, essentially click on the icon, you would get back to uh, your viewport. If you click on the hand uh, toggle, uh, hand icon, uh, your I your uh, cursor turns into a hand and you left click and then you can pan your viewport um, wherever you want. If you click on the orbit, you're, um, you basically get a um, orbit. Now, to cancel each of those icons you just right click in the viewport. Now you can do the movement of the viewports by dragging and left clicking on the corner of the cube on the perspective viewport as you see here or dragging the uh, navigational icons west, north, south which is this red thing and so you can move your uh, mouse around. If you want to pan using your mouse you can click click the middle uh, button or the scroll button while holding it down you can move your mouse and this way you can pan uh, your your viewport okay let's click on this uh, corner of the cube to resize and make the viewport uh, maximize and let's maximize the um, the viewport 
the perspective viewport. Now I want to show you how you can create uh, simple objects and manipulate them in uh, the interface. So if you look at the um, upper right corner of your interface you will see that you'll have several options you're currently in the create mode which is the top uh, left tab here you can click on the modify hierarchy motion display and utilities section but let's go back to the create tab and the create tab you have several items objects that you can create you can create geometry you can create shapes lights cameras helpers space wraps and systems and then we want to create geometry which is simple geometrical objects from the geometry you have uh, several options to select uh, standard primitives, extended primitives, compound objects, particle systems and so forth so for now we want to stick with the uh, standard primitives and the standard primitives you have some pre-defined uh, default objects you have boxes, spheres, cylinders, torises, um, teapot, cone, geosphere, tube, pyramid and plane let's start with placing a sphere um, object. When you click on the sphere object you can create either by the edge mode or the center mode. We keep it in the, in the center mode. Let's keep all the parameters um, by default and when you move your mouse over in the perspective viewport or any, any of the other viewports you see that your uh, cursor had turned into a cross. So to create your object you left click and once you left click you see X, Y and Z um, axes will um, highlight so you can move your mouse up and down or to the right or to the left it doesn't matter because sphere is a one dimensional object essentially defined by its center and its radius if you move your mouse while holding your uh, your left click up it will increase the sphere radius if you move down it will decrease the radius if you move it to the right, it increases the radius. Move it to the left, it, it decreases the radius. And along each direction, if you go along the positive direction of each of these axes, you would see that the radius increases. If you move against the negative direction of each of the axes, the um, um, object gets smaller, or the radius gets smaller. And let's make another one. So basically hold your mouse and drag and as you see you can create spheres of various size once you define the uh, sphere you can change its various by, by its radius by clicking on the parameters and just change the radius you can click on these arrows up increases the radius down decreases the radius and you can change the n number of segments that your sphere is composed of uh, one segment is basically one polyhedra uh, actually which is 4 now we increase it by 5 by 6 7 8 9 so this is the approximation of your radius as you see I'm increasing the number of segments and so the sphere becomes and looks more and more um, sophisticated if you click on unclick uncheck the smooth, ob smooth option your sphere looks pretty much like So if you just right click somewhere else to get out of the sphere creation mode. So if you click on this sphere number 4, you would see that this sphere essentially is made of, um, it's not smooth. And if you click on smooth, you can make the sphere uh, smooth. Okay. Now let's make a box. Um, so for the box, you click on the box, and then your cursor changes shape. And so in this case, you left click, and then you drag your mouse. And this way, you create the um, uh, one face of your box. And then you can move up and down 
to change the other uh, dimension of the box. So the box is now in that sense a two-dimensional object and as you can see it has a length, it has a width and has a height. You can manipulate them, you can make the different segments um, within each um, of the uh, boxes um, objects. So this way you have to do a drag and drop or you can just left click, drag and drop and this way you can create several boxes. Okay, so on the top of the screen you will see a row of several icons and these icons allow you to manipulate your objects. Uh, one of the icons that you will um, use here is the move, um, select and move icon. So when you click on this icon then you can select any of these objects that you created and so and when you select them then you can move the object by dragging along each of the axes that you will see so they will be turned yellow when your mouse is over them and that means that you can drag and move your object along that axis if you wanted to drag them along multiple axes for example here uh, you can go on the plane that is consisted of x and y and this way you can move your object more freely in x and y direction for x and z you can move in x and z direction and for y and z you can move in the y and z direction and if you want to move along all the axes it's a little hard to do but you need to find out the precise location that everything joins together that way you could move it along all the axes I'm not, I'm not able to get it right now but that's the way that you could move your objects along each of the axes. If you press the X, this uh, move axis would be um, hidden and you press the X one more time the move axis will be um, essentially turned on back. So you can create other kinds of objects so let's create a cylinder. For the cylinder you just drag it and that way you create the base of the cylinder and then you drag the mouse you create the second base of the cylinder. For the tube you create the essentially with three clicks you can create tubes for the pyramid you create the base of the pyramid and then you create the height uh, by clicking for torus um, basically you can click and create the radius and then the thickness of your torus um, the teapot again you click it's like an, a sphere. You just click and drag to create teapots of different shapes. Um, for the cone, it's pretty much like a combination of a box and a pyramid. So you left click, drag for the base of the cone, then drag up for uh, the height of the cone, and then left click and then drag your mouse to create the cone uh, essentially with zero ex uh, internal radius or more radius by dragging up and down and finally left click and that way you will leave your um, screen so let's move around this scene and as you see your objects are now placed and you can move them you can rotate your objects uh, let's click on this object. You can rotate it along X and Z axis. You can locate, rotate it along Y and Z axis, or you can rotate it along the X and Y axis. And here are the different rotational angles. Uh, you can uh, select an uniform scale object. So, for example, if you click on um, this sphere, you can click on the base of these um, axes and uniformly select your object along the three axes or you can uh, scale your object along two axes at the same time or you can just uh, singularly select it uh, and scale it along just one single axis so for example for this cone if I want to uh, scale it along Z axis I just drag along the Z axis if I want to scale along X axis I drag it along X axis along y-axis or against 
zx axis against zx uh, y axis against all the axes uniformly by left click and drag your dragging your mouse okay so uh, these are the primitive and basics of manipulating and creating and making objects in the um, 3ds max and uh, so I'll stop it here and I'll encourage you to go on and um, create all these objects and make yourself comfortable with creating uh, objects of primitive type uh, or standard primitives and then move and rotate and scale them um, um, a little bit to just get uh, used to the standard and basic uh, environments of your um, um, of your 3ds max and uh, next week we'll start talking a lot more about uh, creating objects in 3ds max and uh, then we'll hopefully get to start working on um, a little bit of modeling uh, 3d modeling in 3ds max um, okay I hope you enjoy this um, this class and I hope you work and start uh, manipulating 3ds max and working with the 3ds max is uh, uh, I showed you here and I will speak with you next week with um, more basic uh, environments uh, and uh, tools in 3ds Max before we start the modeling thank you very much goodbye now